bless you for that wondrous moment when first I looked upon your cross your wrath appeased my sins forgiven death destroyed and my soul's redemption won let my cry always be only Jesus let my cry always be only Jesus since that day you have been faithful your mercies daily are renewed your spirit strengthens and preserves me those storms will rage still i know you guard my life let my I have no other rock to stand on than Christ to pull me from the fire. And now I wait with hopeful longing for the day when he'll return to claim his bride. Let my cry.
Christ, those uh, here and those joining us online, let's now stand together and let's sing our opening hymn, O Worship the King. His power and 
to be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. That we might prepare our hearts to worship a holy God. Let's say together the collect for purity. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of your hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. And we respond with the Kyrie, asking God to have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. And let us pray, even though in my enthusiasm I failed to bring the prayer book. Now let us pray. Oh God, because without you we are not able to please you, mercifully grant that your Holy Spirit may in all things direct and rule our hearts through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated for the reading of God's holy word. Our children are going to go to children's church, so if you, I would ask the children just to stand. And those who uh, children who are watching on Zoom, let me pray for all of you. Gracious Father, thank you for these children. Lord, continue just to mold and shape them into disciples of Jesus. Lord, may they, may they come to understand the grace of God. And by faith, Lord, may they embrace your forgiveness and new life in Jesus Christ. We pray especially, Lord, for the salvation of every child connected to servants of Christ. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great children's church, you guys. Starting at verse 9. When you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not reap your field right up to its edge. Neither shall you gather the gleanings after your harvest. And you shall not strip your vineyard bare, neither shall you gather the fallen grapes of your vineyard. You shall leave them for the poor and for the sojourner. I am the Lord your God. You shall not steal, you shall not deal falsely, you shall not lie to one another. You shall not swear by my name falsely, and so profane the name of your God. I am the Lord. You shall not oppress your neighbor or rob him, the wages of a hired worker shall not remain with you all night until the morning. You shall not curse the deaf or put a stumbling block before the blind, but you shall fear your God. I am the Lord. You shall do no injustice in court. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great, but in righteousness shall you judge your neighbor. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people, and you shall not stand up against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, but you shall reason frankly with your neighbor, lest you incur sin because of him. The word of the Lord. Thanks be God. Let me invite you to stand. We're going to proclaim Psalm 103 this morning. I'll read to the asterisk and ask that you respond. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. And all that is within me, praise his holy name. Praise the Lord, O oh my soul. And forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your sins. And heals all your infirmities. Who saves your life from the pit. And crowns you with mercy and loving kindness. Who satisfies you with good things. The Lord executes righteousness and judgment for all those who are oppressed with wrong. He shows 
He showed his ways to Moses. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. He will not always chide us. He has not dealt with us according to our sins. For as the heavens are high above the earth, so is his mercy also toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he set our sins from us. As a father pities his own children, so is the Lord merciful to those who fear him. For he knows whereof we are made. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. You may be seated for the second lesson. The second lesson is from Romans chapter 14, starting at verse 5. One person esteems one day as better than another, while another esteems all days alike. Each one should be fully convinced in his own mind. The one who observes the day observes it, observes it in honor of the Lord. The one who eats, eats in honor of the Lord, since he gives thanks to God, while the one who abstains, abstains in honor of the Lord and gives thanks to God. For none of us lives to himself, and none of us dies to himself. For if we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. So then, whether we live or whether we die, we are the Lord's. For to this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and of the living. Why do you pass judgment on your brother? Or you, why do you despise your brother? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. For it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall confess to God. So then, each of us will give an account of himself to God. The word of the Lord. As we prepare for the gospel, we introduced this, this melody uh, last week. Um, this is just simply a new melody to uh, the prayer attributed to St. Francis. Lord,
to you, Lord Christ. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. And when he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave his debt. But when the same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servants fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him into prison until he could pay his debt. And when his fellow servants saw that he had, this had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then the master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all the debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had on you? And in anger, the master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all the debt. So also, my heavenly Father will do every, to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts and minds of your people and may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always acceptable in, in your sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. You may be seated. Well, if you were with me last week, you know that we talked about uh, Peter and this encounter. The disciples are encountering Jesus, and Jesus is teaching them about if your brother sins, or in the Luke version, if he sins against you, you're to go to that brother, and, and then if he repents, and if he doesn't repent, take two or three, and then if he still doesn't repent, bring it to the church. That was the passage you heard last week, and we, we talked about that. But this week is the follow-up to that because like all good adult learners, Peter has been listening intently to Jesus and he's analyzing and trying to put into practice what Jesus has just said. And you remember, Peter has a brother, Andrew, who's right there. And uh, I know they're apostles, but they were also brothers. So we know they had some conflict. And so perhaps Peter is thinking about Andrew when he says, Lord, how many times do I have to forgive my brother? And Peter thinks he's being very, very generous. He says, seven times? And Jesus says, not seven, but 77 times, or in some translations, seven times seven, 70 times seven. And there's a reasons for that discrepancy. But, but regardless if it's 77 or 70 times seven, that's a whole lot of times. And Jesus' point is, you're not to keep a record of wrongs. You're to forgive your brother without limitation. Now, I can tell you that I have been through some very painful um, moments in relationships in my life. A number of years ago, I won't say anything specific about it, but someone betrayed me horribly and it hurt me deeply. And I, I'm a nice guy. You know, just ask John Harris. I'm a nice guy. I don't have any enemies, and yet this person sought to become my enemy, to make me his enemy, and, uh, and it was very, very painful. And so this morning, as we talk about forgiveness, please don't think I'm just sort of up here saying what pastors are supposed to say in the pulpit. I know how hard this is and how deeply some people can hurt us, especially those who approach us as friends, which I think is the reason why in the passion of our Lord, it is Judas who is near to Jesus 
who betrays him because there is no wound like the wound of somebody who's very close to us. Nevertheless, this is what Jesus puts before us. He, he responds to Peter's question because it's on the heart of Peter and it's on our hearts as well. Lord, how, how long do I have to go? How many times do I have to repeat this process? Of my brother or my sister sins against me and I go and I say it to them and, and, and if they say, oh, I'm so sorry, I won't ever do it again and, and then they go back and do it again. How many times? Well, first of all, let me say a couple of clarifying things because I don't want these things running through your minds throughout the entire sermon. First of all, Forgiveness is not the same thing as reconciliation. Jesus in his example in Matthew 18, 15 through 17 is saying, if your brother sins against you, go to your brother. And if he repents, you've, you've gained your brother. You've gained your sister. You've gained that relationship. That's reconciliation. But there are some times when we will, we will come to people and say, you've hurt me deeply. And they'll say, tough. Or, no, I didn't. Or, well, it was your own fault anyway, or whatever they might say. And, and that is not the same thing as reconciliation. But forgiveness is our releasing of that person. It's our saying, I'm not going to keep the wrong. I'm not going to be bound up by this. Somebody famously once said, unforgiveness is like drinking poison, hoping that the other person gets sick. All we do is harm ourselves by holding on to unforgiveness. But that is not the same as reconciliation. And I'm not suggesting that there are some people who are unrepentant in your life for sins they've committed against you that you should restore relationship with them. I'm simply saying we need to all be challenged to forgive them. To forgive them. Well, Jesus understands how difficult forgiveness is, and he, um, he responds to Peter with the, the parable that you have there that I read a little bit ago. It's a pretty famous parable. I think pe- most people are familiar with it, and uh, it's told in Luke as well. And Jesus begins to explain, as I, as I, as I said, that what this means about forgiveness. And he, he, um, he gives him this interesting, um, interesting story about... Um, about a king who forgives a servant who owes him a lot of money uh, or a master and then another servant that comes along. And so you know the story a little bit. Remember, parables are, are stories from the common practice. They're, they're things that are very common so they can explain things that are very complex. Forgiveness, sin and forgiveness is complex. So Jesus uses parables. Oftentimes, remember also that parables have a punchline, like a joke. They have a twist, the thing that's unexpected. And you'll see the, you probably already see the, the, the twist or the punchline of this parable. But just to give you a little bit of information, a talent was the largest monetary value in the ancient world context that Jesus is, is working with here. A talent would have been about 20 years of wages for an average worker, a day worker, you know, which obviously you know, is far lower than other people, but, but it's, that's just kind of a way of, kind of a standard of thinking about it. So if you're working at McDonald's, that's 20 years of work. I don't know why I said McDonald's, but anyway, um, but it's 20 years of work that we're talking about there. So that's a lot of, so when, when Jesus says that this, this one servant had owed the master 10,000 talents, that's, we're talking about 200,000 years of labor, of the common laborer. So that's working at McDonald's for 200,000 years. I mean, I cannot think of anything worse, right? 200,000 years, that's a lot. So we're, that's the amount of money we're talking about here. So, so, this, that, so you need to understand that. You also need to understand that the second servant, the, the, the servant who is not forgiven the debt of the fellow servant who just received this amazing forgiveness, I mean, that's like the, the, we're talking about like the, the you know, 10,000 talents is like the, 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 the national debt, all right? That, that's just the kind of amount that we're talking about, an insurmountable amount uh, of money. And, and Jesus intends to be, you know, hyperbolic here. He, he intends to be speaking in hyperbole because he wants to make them understand how incredibly large this debt is that this guy's been forgiven. Now, a denarii was not un... un you know, unimportant, a denarii would have represented about a third of a year's work of an average worker. So that's working at McDonald's for four months. Plenty enough. I worked at Hardee's for about a year, and let me tell you, 
I'm glad that I don't work at Hardy. That's why I work so hard as a pastor because I don't want to go back to Hardy's. But four months is a long time, but it's nothing compared to 200,000 years, right, of work. That's, that is so much more that it's almost like joke, of, you know, it's just a joke to think about trying to compare the two. And yet, what does Jesus do in this parable? And here's the punchline. Here's the punchline that Jesus gives. This, this wicked servant who's just basically won the lottery is unwilling to turn around and forgive a relatively small amount of debt. Now, it's not minuscule. It's not $10. You know, working four months is nothing to laugh about. That's a lot of money. But you've just received an unimaginable amount of forgiveness. How can you then turn around and, and hold this person responsible? Remember that Jesus is talking to, he, he's responding to Peter's question, the real question Peter's asking. Why would you not forgive? Well, there's no real reason unless you just don't at all get how great a debt you've just been forgiven. Now, you can make the argument, well, you know, it's like I've been forgiven this incredible debt, but I still don't have any money. So I need that four months worth of wages in order to live off of. So, well, it's okay. But, but you've just been given an unimaginable amount of debt forgiveness and you can't see it any way in your heart to at least work with this guy, right? He didn't even try to say, well, pay me back when you can or, you know, I've, I've, I've come into some good fortune here lately. Let me. He just throws him into jail and says, I want you to be judged for this and I want you to have to pay every penny. Well, Jesus is getting at the question that Peter is, is really asking below the question. How is it possible, Jesus, for me to actually forgive somebody who has offended me, who sinned against me in a, in a major way, in a significant way, in a four months worth of wages kind of way? Not little baby forgiveness, but I'm talking about serious things. How can I possibly do that? That's the question that, that, G, that Peter is asking Jesus. How do I let that debt go? How do I quit talking about that thing? How do I show mercy and just let them off the hook? And Jesus, in response, gives this parable. The realization that Jesus wants to bring in mind is that until anyone recognizing the, recognizes the overwhelming sin debt forgiveness that they have received, they, they, they truly come to understand the gravity of their own sinfulness, their own brokenness before God, and then understand that God has forgiven them that debt there is no possible way that you can begin to do it. It requires you not to focus on the sinner, but on the Lord who has forgiven you. Now, there's, there's two responses that I find normally among people when we talk about this idea of that we are sinners, that there is, as the old prayer book used to say, that there is no health in us. One of two responses. One is this, this people go beyond that and go, you know what, I hear all that, Alex, but my sin is so great, God couldn't possibly forgive me for my sin. I've heard people, many people say that to me. I, 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 I can't let God just let me off the hook. I've done too many things. I can't believe God would forgive me all of my sins. I will tell you that's probably the minority response. The majority response is, I'm not that bad. God should give me a break. I've been a pretty good guy. Who is God to tell me that I'm a rotten, miserable sinner? That I have no health within me? That, that I am utterly in, unable to to stand before him and call anything that I do righteous. Every good effort that I've made, who is he to say that every good effort I've ever made is tainted with sin and that it's not in fact that my righteousness is, is filthy rags? This I find to be the majority response and to be the chief problem with being a pastor. And if you want to know why not to ever be a pastor, 
It's because you have to stand in front of people and convince them that they're a bigger sinner than they think they are. I'm looking at Karen because Karen's in the process of, of discerning him, his own call to ministry. And, and that's hard. You know, I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a nice guy. I want people to like me. I, I enjoy talking about the love of God and the, and the, and the glory of the cross and the resurrection. And, and we're, we're talking about that this morning as well. But, but, but the reality is that that. that what Jesus communicates in this parable is that this one servant has a, a debt to be paid that is impossible to pay. The, the servant cries out just like this majority response and says, give me some more time, master. I, I will, I'll make this debt right. Yeah, how are you going to pay off 200,000 years of work? Explain that to me, right? There's, not, there's no impossible. But well, let, me just, let me just work on it. It's interesting, uh, Ben Kwashi, who's an archbishop in Nigeria, I was reading something by him this week, and, and, and Archbishop Ben says, he says, you know, think about the rich young ruler. And I'd never thought about this. You know, the rich young ruler comes to Jesus, and Jesus says, he says, what, do you, what, what must I do to be your follower? And Jesus says, sell everything, give to the poor, and come follow me. And the young man goes away sad because he has so much wealth. But, but Archbishop Ben makes the point that this young man should have cried out to Jesus, Jesus, I have a lot of wealth. And I have no, I have no way of, I, I don't I know how I could just give it all away. Will you help me give my money away so that I can come follow you? But what does he do? And I love the way Archbishop then says it. He says, what does he do? He thinks that he has to do it on his own. And that's our problem. You see, if, if I can add something to salvation, if I can do something to earn God's favor, well, then I can, sac I can keep a little bit of pride for myself. I don't have to grovel and humble myself to the point of saying, there is no health in me. And yet, what does Jesus tell us in this parable? You and I are that servant. We owe 200,000 years of labor and none of us will live past 120, and I'm being gracious there, right? So good luck, even if you make a lot more money than the average, you could never pay that amount of debt. And so it is for the sin debt that we owe. It's, it's, it's beyond comparison. This With our Wednesday night Romans class, um, Paul talks in, in Romans 1 about the, the glory of the, of the gospel of Jesus. And he's not ashamed because it's the power of God for salvation. And then right after those wonderful verses, he says, the wrath of God is poured out against man. And I'm telling the class, I don't know why Paul starts in such a negative tone. Why are you taking us to negative town, Paul? Well, because until we understand how grave our sin problem is, we can't possibly understand how great his grace is. Amen? Amen. You see, that's, that's the point. It's, it's not, the, the point of Jesus' parable is not work harder, you know, try harder, or look at what Jesus did for you. You can't forgive your sister. Have you ever had that pulled on you, you know? You know, it's like, Jesus died on the cross for you, and you cannot, and you're going to hit your sister, Really? Or you're not going to forgive your brother for that. Jesus died on the cross for you. You know, this is not, what, this is not what's going on. Sometimes our parenthood, and I appreciate you parents, I understand. You, you get desperate. You're looking for everything. I'll throw Jesus at them. See if that works. But that's not what, that's not at all what Jesus, he's not trying to guilt us into being good, into forgiving. Jesus is drawing out the realization that until we see the glory of God, a God who had absolutely no reason to show us grace and mercy, just like the master towards the servant. And yet, because he knows the servant can't pay the debt, forgives it, cancels it, then we will never understand the kingdom of God. Now, I've purposely rushed over the parable, you notice the way the parable begins. We talked about parables back a few back in July with, in back with the kingdom of God. This is the kingdom of God, Jesus says. This is the kingdom of God. It's a God who forgives an infinite sin debt of every human being. 
And to grasp that and to know the glory of the grace of God, which is poured out chiefly in his mercy on undeserving human beings, you'll never begin to understand how a person could forgive a significant sin against them. This is big stuff, you guys. This is the kingdom of God. This is what it looks like. He's saying, Peter, I know you're struggling with this, but until you fully understand the glory, you're not going to get it. We focus on the second part of the parable, but it's the, it's the first part of the parable that should capture our hearts and minds, and that's the point. That's the punchline. If you're having trouble forgiving someone for the sin they've done against you, don't look at the person, look to the Lord. Be willing to admit that, yes, Lord, I am a sinner. I have the faith to believe that there really is nothing in me that is righteous before you, and yet you chose to die for me on the cross. And believe that because Christ died, he could forgive that sin, and because he is the Son of God, he would rise from the dead, showing that he had the power to transform your life, and that that's the power of transformed life. That's what Paul was talking about back in Romans 12, 1 and 2. Not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, by, by recognizing the glory of God in his willingness to forgive us at the cross and believing to confess that he is Lord. And so not to be like the young, the young rich man saying, well, I, I, I can't give up all my money, so I'm leaving to say, Lord, I, I don't know how to give up my money, but will you help me? Because it's my God, and I can't imagine trying to give up that money. It's not a coincidence that Jesus uses money a lot in his parables, you know. I mean, it hits home, doesn't it? It takes, the, it takes the complex, and he makes it very practical. When we think in terms of debt and debt forgiveness and extending debt to other people or forgiveness to other people, I've run through my notes. I don't know where I am. Well, here I am. So the reality of the kingdom is this. Why, why, why is it so counter for, for this servant to then turn around and not forgive the debt? Because the kingdom, citizens of the kingdom of God, when we understand the grace of God, we not only forgive the people who begin to learn how to forgive. I'm not making it easy. Remember I said before, but we want to learn to forgive people. But in fact, we begin to beseech the master himself that he would give these other people a break. You know what I'm saying? That we would begin to say, Lord, please don't hold that sin against that person. And our prayers of the people, we only, we don't only pray for the, for the persecuted church, but we pray for those who persecute them. It's Christianity that has a, a corner on this market of forgiveness. You know, we, we, this, is, this is a paramount to our faith. This is front and center that, that we are called by our master to love our enemies, to forgive those who willfully hurt us and persecute us. I don't think I was ever so moved is when a couple of years ago, Jody and I were a group of pastors in Gainesville. We were allowed, the same pastors I've been working with over the last few years, we were allowed to go watch a movie that Steph Curry produced called Emmanuel. And it was about the, the Emmanuel Nine, the, the nine uh, African Methodist Episcopal members that were killed, murdered by the young man who came in with a gun. It's about five years ago. He walks in, shares Bible study fellowship with them. They welcome him in. And then after the end of the Bible study, he stands up and he begins to shoot people randomly. He didn't know any of them. White young man, hatred in his heart, killing nine African Americans and wounding others. But the most powerful part of the story is to go to the scenes they shot from the courtroom. As not every, but some of the victims' families said to the young man, because they were given permission by the judge to speak to the accused, and what you heard them say was, I forgive you, and I am praying for your salvation. I'm praying that you will know the love of God and that you will understand that the love of God 
is greater than the hate that you've displayed towards the person that I loved. Friends, that is only knowable if we've experienced the grace of God. And I know it's a bummer to hear that you're a sinner, but it's true. You know, I'm just, maybe I'm just well aware of my own flaws and brokenness, but you know, I, I don't have any problem saying that there is nothing righteous within me. Apart from the grace of Christ, I am done. But in, in the glory of God's grace, he has forgiven me. And because he's forgiven me, I want to extend that grace to others. Even when it's hard, even, and I, I told you, an awful betrayal and hurtful. And if I told you what happened, you'd, you'd, you would be mad at them too. But I've come to forgive them. And to even begin to pray for them. Not because I'm so holy, but because God is so holy and merciful and graceful. The word that the parable uses, had pity, had mercy on the servant who forgives the huge debt. It's the same word where Jesus says he looks out on the crowds and he has compassion on them. He suffers with them. He understands that they can't bear the weight. And so... He sends his son Christ into the world to bear his wrath, his righteous indignation against sin, to bear the weight of our sin, to take it upon himself, to die in our place. Peter, how can you learn to forgive your brother, not just seven times, but 77 times? You gotta look to the grace of God. Two things I'll say practically, application-wise. One is there's a book that that I'm so glad to see Ramona here. Ramona and the Women's Bible Study recently went through called Total Forgiveness by R.T. Kendall. R.T. Kendall, Total Forgiveness. I highly recommend that book. This is a process. This takes a while. But it begins by admitting that you need to forgive. Secondly, I, will, I, I learned a prayer to pray that I've used with lots of people as a pastor, and I'll just share it with you. And It's, it's not hard to remember, but you basically say, you, you say, this person sinned against me. I did this with my political enemies last night, by the way. <laughs> the people that I consider to be political enemies, the people that I am mad at at a national level, right? I, I plug their names in, but you can do it with anybody, but particularly personally, I think it's important um, What they did mattered, and it hurt me very deeply. God's forgiveness doesn't mean that he takes, he's shallow or uncaring about our pain. It mattered, and it hurt me very deeply. But then you say, but I choose to forgive them, and I ask you to forgive them. And then if you have the guts, and I ask you to bless them, And I ask you to bless me. Now, the first time you do that, because I've done this with a lot of people, it will just be because you know you're supposed to. But spiritually, there is a breakthrough in that moment. You humanize that person and you recognize that they're just another servant with a debt that they can't possibly pay. And God will begin to give you the desire to forgive them. This morning, who do you need to forgive? I don't mean just the politicians or the people that or whoever your bad guys are, but who personally do you need to forgive? Who is the Lord waiting to help you release you from that poison that will bring no good effect in your life? And in fact, prevents you from really understanding the grace of his love and forgiveness. Let me pray for us. Father, this is, this is tough stuff, Lord, and, and it's so clear through all the readings today how much you care about community. And Lord, you know we are so capable of hurting each other 
And Lord, we, we just pray that, that we as Christians once again would, would claim our right to this rock bed of, of Jesus' teaching on forgiveness. And that we would practice it. And that through it, Lord, you would transform us and that people would see and that they would be changed. That they would reach out to you because they see, Lord, that you give us the power to even forgive our enemies. Oh, Lord, thank you for your grace. Pour out your glory, Lord. Reveal yourself. You are so worthy of praise, honor, and in fact, all of our lives. Help us to see that, Lord. Give us the faith eyes to see that. In Jesus' name, amen. seeing creed we believe in one God the Father of the Almighty maker of heaven and earth of all that is visible and invisible we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ the only begotten Son of God eternally begotten of the Father God from God light from light true God from true God begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit, and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the Scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the church and for the whole world, saying, Hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world and for the well-being and unity of the people of God. Lord, this is a, a very difficult time we live in. And God, I, there's so much division in our country. And Lord, I prayed this four years ago. I'm praying it now. Lord, let us pray on this matter that you would bring harmony in the hearts of believers who prefer um, politically with God, that you would just bring your peace in these situations and help us to love regardless. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, hear our prayer. For Foley, our Archbishop, Neil, our Bishop, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese and congregation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, 
and for all who teach and disciple others. Lord, in your mercy, for our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith, and we pray for those that persecute them, that they will find you. Lord, in your mercy, for our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service. Lord, in your mercy, for all of those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. We pray especially for the fires out west. Lord, in your mercy, for all of those who have departed in this life, in the certain hope of the resurrection, in thanksgiving, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Almighty God, your truth endures from age to age. Direct in our time, we pray, those who speak where many listen and write where many read, that they may speak your truth to make the heart of this people wise, its mind discerning and its will righteous, to the honor of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins to Almighty God. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in his great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who sincerely repent and with true faith turn to him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of our Lord be always with you. I invite you to stand and to wave the wave of peace to one another. God's peace. Glad, good to see all of you here, and uh, we do appreciate your vote of confidence as, as folks are beginning to test out the, the coming lives of the service. We are being very diligent with, uh, with our precautions, 
I do ask you to pray for Alachua County. Uh, following the Labor Day weekend and, and following the start of school and the and UF and Santa Fe, uh, there is predictably going to be a rise in the number of cases. We've already seen that, but we're asking that the Lord would intervene and, uh, and bring healing and protect us in the midst of this. So uh, thank you for complying with what we've asked and, and for trusting us to come to the service. So it's good to see so many here today. Reminder that we are having a, a Littlewood work day that's coming up uh, next Saturday, the 19th. That's going to be from 9 to 12. Uh, we'd love to have you come and be a part of that. It'll be all outside, so we'll be social distancing. Bring gloves, uh, any kind of hedge trimmers you have, either powered or uh, gas power would be great. And be sure to bring your mask and water bottle because it will be hot out there, we know. Um, we, we did deliver those care packages to the Littlewood teachers, and they were very appreciative. Two other quick reminders. We would love to have you update your directory information. Time again to update our directory. People are joining us. Uh, either virtually or in, in, in person here at the service and, and wanting to make uh, servants their, their church home. And so that's exciting, but we want to make sure all of our information is updated. So please do check the information there. And, and there is a way for you to online uh, through, the, through the, the digital connect card to, to let Nikki know any updates to email addresses and all that kind of stuff. And then lastly, this seems completely self-serving, but it's actually Nikki made me say this. And Nikki said... <laughs> You can go to your favorite uh, Apple or, or Android stores and you can download our, um, you, can, you can actually access our uh, sermons through podcasts on those, uh, those servers, whatever that means. Jose and David will explain that to me later. But, but anyway, so you can, but so there's ways for you to watch. This. So Nikki, because she's working, doesn't get to listen to my sermon. And so she said, I listen to your sermon on a podcast during the week. And, and so I want to make sure people know that they don't just have to go to Facebook Live, they can actually listen on a podcast. So now I've made that announcement, and I told her I only make it once. So um, again, we're going to offer communion. Come to the side that you're on. Uh, the ushers will direct you. Two stations on each side. Stand, please, where you see the cushions. And, uh, and then if we do have gluten-free wafers, of course. And then uh, make sure you're six feet between you and the person returning to your seat. Last announcement is that... The ushers, again, will, will direct us out at the, at the closing, at the recessional song. So wait until the ushers direct you, and then they'll, they'll lead us out from the back to the front. So God bless all of you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, our duty and our joy always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, through Jesus Christ our Lord, for he is your true living word from before time and for all ages. By him you created all things and by him you make all things new. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy. 
Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent your only Son into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all that by his suffering and death, we might be saved. By his resurrection, he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As your great high priest, he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. And we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people, the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him that he may dwell in us and we in him. And bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom, where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit. Our honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Alleluia, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. Let the people come to the Lord's table.
reminded that I didn't say the spiritual, for, spiritual for communion prayer. So can we just pause? Thank you. Dear Jesus, we believe that you truly present in this holy sacrament. I love you above all things. I desire to possess you within my soul. And since I cannot now receive you sacramentally, I beseech you to come spiritually into my heart. I unite myself to you together with all your faithful people, and I embrace you with all the affections of my soul. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen.
let's sing our post-communion prayer. You know, we can stand if you'd like. Heart to thee. 
one thing to say, I know that for those that are, that are here in person, uh, last week, Aletheia Church had the, the exit blocked, and so I've, I'm, we're trying to figure out what's going on over there. If you find out you can't get out, just carefully back out the, the inn, but do be careful because if somebody's turning in there, they may not be expecting a car coming out, so we apologize. We'll get that figured out for next week, so. This becomes one of all of our problems, right? All of our problems, we send to the cross of Christ. All of our difficulties, we send to the cross of Christ. All the devil's works, we send to the cross of Christ. And all of our hopes, we set on the risen Christ. Alleluia, alleluia. Let us go forth into the world, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Alleluia, alleluia.